Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Jack Gallant as our speaker today. And uh, Jack um, is, uh, look, Jack got his uh, PhD fr from Yale, and then he did his postdoctoral fellowships at Caltech and then Washington University Medical School. And he's been a professor since 1995 at the University of California at Berkeley, where he is now the, um, what do you call it again? <laughs> the Chancellor's Professor of Psychology. I don't uh, really know what that means. We don't know what that means, but it's, it's a big deal. Uh, <laughs> um, Jack has been an innovator uh, in visual neuroscience uh, from the beginning. Um, uh, back in his days doing uh, single unit recording in monkeys and uh, introducing the use of more natural stimuli like nature movies uh, for monkeys. Um, at, but since in 2008, he really broke onto the scene in the um, world of functional brain imaging in humans with a really disruptive paper uh, uh, on uh, decoding or in how natural images are encoded in brain activity. And that's been followed up by a series of landmark papers on um, uh, encoding of, of movie stimuli, encoding of semantic spaces uh, in movies, and encoding of semantic spaces in uh, heard stories. And now he's going to tell us um, how he is going to produce a complete functional atlas of the human brain, which I think is one of the more audacious titles we've had. Uh, but but so you, this, this says I will work toward one. <laughs> well, we assume, okay. Uh -huh. yeah. Critical difference. Critical difference, <laughs> but, but, but still a big promise. No, I just have to get delta towards it. I don't have to <laughs> Are you weaseling out on us? It just has to be significant. <laughs> yes. OK. Well, thanks a lot, Jack. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Jim. Oh, uh, I'm going to yell. If uh, my yelling starts to reduce in volume, it means I'm going to sleep because I got up early this morning. So uh, I will start using the little microphone here on the desk if somebody raises their hand or just alerts me that I am um, not yelling loudly enough. Uh, I am doing this psychophysics experiment today where there are bars across the top of the screen. And your job is to ignore the bars as best you can because they do not contain any information. So at the end, I'll poll people to see how many people notice the bars at the end of the experiment. And we'll, we'll find out, right? Um, so this is kind of an audacious title, but it's really what I view my lab as doing these days. I mean, I started as a neurophysiologist. And in neurophysiology, of course, we're, we can't measure all 80 billion neurons in the brain. So we measure some small, vanishingly small fraction of the neurons. And we try to build models for each neuron. And then we aggregate those models together, like a, a bunch of individual butterflies. And we try to collect the butterflies and classify them and determine what the neurons as an aggregate are doing. And uh, my view of MRI is basically the same. Now, instead of neurons, I'm recording from voxels, which is uh, a uh, sort of energetic analog of neurons. It's not really neurons. Of course, we're measuring bold effects, not, not neural activity. Uh, and we're measuring those bold effects aggregated over about 5 million neurons. But the problem is generally the same. We have a bunch of individual voxels that we can measure in the brain. And across the human cortex, in modern MRI, we can measure about 50,000 voxels. And for each voxel, we want to model that voxel. Then all of our voxels are like a bunch of individual butterflies that we've collected. And we want to aggregate those butterflies together and classify them and determine how we should sort of divide up the butterfly space into various taxa. And uh, we want, since these uh, butterflies in the cortex are spatially arranged across the surface of the brain, we want to uh, associate each sort of class of butterflies or each kind of uh, voxel model with different areas of the brain. Uh, so let me just take a poll. How many people are generally familiar with MRI, I mean, at a working level? Almost everybody. Is there anybody who has no clue, has never heard of MRI before? OK, no lucky people. Good. So you're all unlucky. You've been subjected to MRI for many years. And I'm going to mostly ignore MRI. Um, let's start with neurons. This is a great paper from Clay Reed uh, from the one visual area we can claim we actually pretty much understand, which is primary visual cortex, area V1. Uh, this is a, um, a voltage sensitive dye picture of V1. For, and if we zoom in to this really small area of uh, V1, this voltage sensitive dye uh, is actually color coded so that color corresponds to orientation. 
And you can see that there's all kinds of orientations represented in this orientation pinwheel. And if we zoom in to this small area and we do calcium imaging, we can show differently oriented bars while we record calcium images. And we can color code the neurons in that little patch of cortex. And we can see that the neurons are orientation tuned. And this orientation tuning follows the columnar architecture. Because of course, all of cortex that we know of developmentally uh, develops in terms of columns. And so columns are sort of one of the natural computational units to think about uh, cortical uh, coding of features and cortical representation. Now, if we zoom out and look at all of V1, um, we end up with something like this. So uh, this is a, a flattened macaque V1. Uh, this is an experiment that was done in 1988. It was a pretty heroic experiment. The animal was injected with a radioactive dye. And he was shown a checkerboard retinotopic mapping stimulus like this. And for a long time, and the radioactive dye was bound to sugar. And at the end of the experiment, the brain was extracted from the animal. This is, of course, a one-way experiment. The brain was flattened between two photographic plates and developed like a piece of film. And you can see the retinotopic map on the surface of cortex that map matches the retinotopic map that we showed the animal. This is, of course, flipped because these should be the opposite sign. Now, um, so we can see that retinotopy is an organizing principle in primary visual cortex. If you had to think about what is the global variable that's mapped, across primary visual cortex, it would be retinotopy. But if we zoom in to each individual retinotopic location, like just this little place here, we find out that there are a bunch of other dimensions that are also represented at V1. Here's an orientation map. Here's a spatial frequency map. Here's a, ooh, ooh, this is, this is also duplicated in some hideous way. <laughs> oh my lord. <laughs> wow. Okay, fortunately, who really cares? Fine, this is not your dominance map. <laughs> not your dominance map here. Uh, and so if you add up the number of dimensions that are represented at each retinotopic location, it ends up being that uh, each sort of hyper column, each small collection of columns, each retinotopic location codes in something like a 15 dimensional space. Right? So um, there's a 15 dimensional space that's projected down onto a two dimensional sheet. And the way the projection works is there's a global variable, which is retinotopy. And there's all these variables that are coded locally, which is all the other 12 or 10 or 12 or 15 dimensions that are represented at each retinotopic location. This is the one visual area we know about, right? All the other visual areas are more mysterious. But we can kind of assume, well, OK, maybe V1 is doing as much as it can do. Maybe every brain area is coding in some 15-dimensional space. But they're just coding in all different kinds of 15-dimensional spaces. And if uh, you guys have all seen this uh, hierarchy before, this is the Van Essen hierarchy going from the retina to LGN to V1, and then off to all the other visual areas. This is from 1992. There were about 32 known visual areas in the macaque. Now we're up to about 38 or 40. Um, and the top of this pyramid is actually the hippocampus, which is, of course, just the beginning for a lot of brain systems, right? So if we looked at the human brain, we would end up with all of these, say, 40 visual areas, plus a bunch of other visual areas, because the human brain is larger, and human brains have language. And uh, languages, of course, can interact with visual information. So um, each of these connections is uh, bidirectional. Uh, the pathways are in parallel and, and hierarchically arranged. And each of these connections is nonlinear. Because there's no reason to send information linearly from one brain area to another. Linear transformation is just a rotation of the coordinate system. It doesn't give you any new information. So each one of these areas is collecting information from a bunch of other areas and nonlinear transforming it and creating a new kind of representation that makes information explicit that is only implicit in the input. Okay. And at some level, a big part of neuroscience is trying to divide the brain into its constituent areas, assuming there are that an area is a meaningful unit throughout the entire brain, and trying to find out what information is represented in each area. And uh, if you look at the macaque where a lot of tracing studies have been done. Uh, you see that there's about 400 total areas. Um, each area has about a 50% chance of being connected to every other area. Uh, about a third of the areas are subcortical nuclei, which I'm going to proceed to ignore. I refer to those as the giblets of the turkey. I'm interested in the skin of the turkey. <laughs> the other two thirds of the, um, of the areas are cortical areas. right? And again, um, this is arranged in, just like in the visual system, a hierarchical parallel network. Now, this particular diagram came only from anatomical studies. So we know what the anatomical areas here are, but we don't know what the functional assignment is of each area. Of course, to really understand the system, you want, you want to know 
um, the anatomical <coughs> structure of the system and the functional uh, assignment of each of the areas. Now, human brain is, of course, much bigger than the macaque. If I flattened your cortex out, I would end up with something about the size of a pizza. Uh, monkeys got a cortex only about the size of a cookie. So you have a lot more visual, a lot more brain areas probably than the macaque. Estimates are you have something like, say, 600 individual areas and nuclei that all code different information about the world and about the internal space. And uh, my job is to map those functionally. Now, a lot of people have taken up the job of mapping these structurally. So you guys have all seen this. This is uh, Brodmann's areas after Brodmann, uh, 1910 or so. Um, at the beginning of this century, there were several competing anatomical parcellations of cortex. They were all perfectly valid, and the one that won is Brodmann. So everybody remembers Brodmann's areas. Nobody remembers the other 50 proposals for anatomical areas in humans. But in some sense, it doesn't matter, because all this anatomy came from post-mortem histological studies of the human brain. And now we can do something much better, uh, at least better for the human in question, because we can map anatomy in the human brain without uh, the person dying first. And we can do that with, uh, right now, diffusion imaging. So this is one diffusion imaging study. In this particular case, the brain, if you notice, it doesn't have any folds. And that's because the brain has been inflated. So uh, you can think of the human brain or a macaque brain as a beach ball that's had all the air sucked out of it to make your head as small as possible to make it easy for your mother to give birth to you. But from a uh, scientific point of view, that's annoying. So what we do is we put an air hose into the beach ball and we kind of blow it up into a brain-shaped beach ball. And then we can look at the distribution of all the areas across the surface of this beach ball. Right? Uh, so this is a, an inflated brain. And this is a parcellation of the brain or a division into anatomical areas. That comes from diffusion MRI. Diffusion MRI, just to make a really long story short, uh, is an MRI pulse sequence that is sensitive to the direction of the flow of water. And since a neuron is kind of like a tube of fat, water tends to go along the neuron instead of through the neuron. And you can follow the flow of water to try to find the major fiber tracks in uh, the human brain from an anatomical perspective. Diffusion imaging is a horrible, horrible method for finding small fiber tracks, but it works pretty well for, for large fiber tracks. So uh, you can get 70, 100, something like that areas out of diffusion MRI. That might be real areas or might not, but they're at least candidate areas. However, these areas have no functional assignment. They are only anatomical areas. And of course, they're a subset of the anatomical areas because scaling rules from the macaque to the human suggest that we should end up with a number something like 600, not a number like 70. So there's more to be done. Now, as you all know, there's a very close relationship between, in the human brain and in all mammalian brains between uh, structure and function. So this is a diffusion imaging picture from Van Medine. This is a functional MRI picture. And uh, the thing to remember is on a short time scale, um, the wiring in the brain is fixed. It takes you about 20 minutes to grow a new synapse. So uh, you can up and down regulate synapses very quickly. But actually growing a new connection in the brain takes a half an hour or so. So as you're listening to me talk and your thoughts are fleeting from one thing to another, those thoughts are arising by differential information flow through the network, where the wiring of the network stays exactly constant. So uh, at some level, there should be a very close relationship between the anat anatomical structure of the brain and the functional structure of the brain. And so you should be able to solve the brain either by doing anatomy or by doing function, or probably the only way to do it in the end is going to be to do them both at the same time. And there's a lot of people who are doing anatomical parcellation of the brain uh, using a diffusion MRI. And there are relatively few people trying to do a functional parcellation of the whole brain, rather than just focusing on one area, trying to find all the areas of the brain, as many as you can find, and trying to give a functional assignment of each brain. And that's what we're trying to do. Now, I'm not the only one doing this right now. There are a few other groups doing this. Uh, this is uh, parcellation from resting state data from the, um, that I think this is uh, Steve Smith's group, but this is the Human Connectome Project data. So the Human Connectome Project was a giant NIH boondoggle to collect resting state data in thousands of people. And uh, they collected very high quality resting state data. I'm not a big fan of resting state data, so that's why I call it a boondoggle, but the data quality is excellent. Uh, and now resting state data, does everybody know resting state data? Uh, basically, uh, to get resting state data, you put somebody in the magnet and you tell them, don't think of anything. And of course, what people do in this situation is they start thinking, when the heck do I get out of this magnet? I really hate being in here. It's really noisy. Where's my money? Why am I still lying in this magnet? So they talk to themselves. And uh, 
We now know, now, you know, if you think about science as being, you know, a regression problem that has some X variables, which are the things you manipulated, and some Y variables, which are the things you measured, in resting state data, we have nothing that we manipulated, so we have no X variables. So in this case, the only thing you can do is look at the covariances of the Ys because it's all the data you have, and that's what people do. They take the resting state data, and they look at the covariances of the Ys, and you can actually use that, those covariances, you can uh, submit them to a cluster analysis, and you can essentially uh, create a functional parcellation of uh, aerial units across the surface of cortex that have all the same covariance structure with other parts of the brain. Right? It's a perfectly valid way to parcellate the brain. And you can end up with something on the order of, say, two to 400 areas, depending on who you believe and uh, how reliable this data is. None of these areas have any functional assignment, right? Because in resting state data, you have no function. All you know is uh, people are lying in the magnet. So you don't really know what they're doing. Um, you can use a multimodal method. So this is another paper from the Human Connectome Project. Um, and I should mention, full disclosure, the person who's running the Human Connectome Project is David Van Essen, who's my old uh, boss, my old advisor. Um, so I trust David to, to be very careful about data quality. So the Human Connectome Project, I think, is pretty high quality data. Uh, I don't like a lot of things in the Human Connectome Project. Um, I don't like the fact that they collect your resting state. And I don't really like their tasks. The tasks they used, the Human Connectome Project collected anatomical data, which was diffusion imaging and myelin and white matter or gray matter divisions. And they collected resting state data and they collected some tasks. But the tasks were not that rich. They were very simple tasks. As a consequence, they don't end up being that useful. Uh, but if you aggregate all the data together, you can create a, a complicated parcellation of the cortex that is essentially a multimodal parcellation that tries to use both anatomical and task-related data. And uh, this is a paper that came out in Nature just like a month ago. Um, in some respects, this parcellation is good. You, can't, you can hardly even see it in the slide. In some respects, it's good. In some respects, it's bad. It tends to, the way they did the <coughs> experiment tends to create these really long uh, sort of armadillo bands across the surface of cortex that are probably not valid parcellations, but it's a start. OK. So I want to do functional parcellation uh, that so first order doesn't involve anatomy, but gives us the best, richest functional parcellation that we can possibly get. So we have a lot of goals for this experiment, uh, for this research program. We want to get a functional parcellation that generalizes to many stimuli and task states as possible. So we can get a functional parcellation in one task, and it accurately predicts functional maps in another task. Uh, we want to recover as much of the intrinsic tuning space uh, as possible. So we want to know as much about each voxel as we can. Uh, we want to be able to map individual differences in these functional parcellations because, after all, not every brain's the same. Brains are as different as, say, our ears, right? And everybody has basically the same ear, but on the other hand, everybody's ear is different, right? So we want to have a model that accounts for that. Um, we want to be able to deal with any changes in functional parcellation or functional assignment due to task demands. For example, if you're listening to me speak versus uh, thinking about the dinner you're going to have this evening, your brain might reorganize. And uh, that might involve changes in either the function of a given area or actually the, the division of and layout of the brain distribution into different areas. We don't really know. And finally, of course, we want to link function and anatomy, but we haven't really dealt with that issue uh, yet very much. OK. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about, um, give you one example of how we do this uh, in a certain domain, which is semantic knowledge, conceptual knowledge. And we've done a lot of experiments on this today for various reasons I won't go into. Uh, but the rest of the talk is going to be the experimental part of the talk, and that's divided into these four different questions. The first are, uh, how are semantic concepts mapped across cortex? We want to get as detailed a map as possible as we can. How do semantic maps vary across individuals, and how do they relate to the anatomical structure of the brain? How are these semantic maps for language related to the semantic maps for vision? And you might think, OK, language semantics is clear, right? That's the meaning of language. Vision semantics is the meaning of vision. And of course, vision has a meaning, right? When you, when you look at the, at the scene here, you see me. I'm a guy standing here. There's a screen. There's some lettering on the screen. You know the assignment and the division of the world into its semantic components. So when we talk about visual semantics, we mean that sort of categorical level of description of the scene. And finally, do these maps change with uh, attention and other top-down effects? You were working a second ago. Nothing's working today. All my technology is failing me. 
All right, um, so I'm just giving you the semantic uh, story because that's kind of the story that's done in the lab. And the main story will be a paper we published last spring, but there will be a few other glosses on that that are uh, sort of reports of ongoing work. Um, now, before we did this study, this is kind of what we knew about the distribution of the language systems and semantic knowledge. This is a nice review paper from uh, Hickok and Popel. And um, this shows what they call a dual stream model of language. So the idea is that there's a ventral stream for, uh, excuse me, a ventral stream for language. All right, which one? Oh, here we go. Uh, there's a ventral stream for language, which is basically a language comprehension stream. So when you listen to language, sound comes into your uh, ears. It's represented as a sound spectrogram. Then a whole bunch of increasingly complicated features are extracted. Phonemes, uh, syllables, words, sentences, and so on. And all that has to, you can, you can think of that as paralleling the visual process that goes from pixels up to objects, right? The world is being segmented, the language world is being segmented in increasingly complicated uh, uh, structures. And there's a lot of evidence uh, from uh, prior lesion work that this, uh, what they call a ventral stream, although I'm not sure that analogy is really appropriate, is very bilaterally distributed. And the low level features are known to be represented uh, in the superior temporal uh, sulcus and in a few uh, specific locations near superior temporal sulcus. And the conceptual knowledge, you'll notice, is over here, although you can barely read this. This says conceptual knowledge, and it says widely distributed. Conceptual knowledge is semantics, and their model of semantics is it's all of this gray stuff everywhere else. Okay? So it's basically just assigning it to semantics. Okay? Um, there's also a dorsal stream that they include, which is the speech production stream. And the speech production stream is very left lateralized. That's you know, Broca's area, for example, and other associated production areas. And that's very clearly left hemisphere dominant for normal right-handed people. And uh, we're not going to be talking about that today, although we'll return to it at the end. Uh, now, some other people have been a little more ambitious about uh, dividing up the semantic parts of the brain into their um, fine-grained uh, parcellation. This is a nice review from Jeff Binder, and he divides things up into essentially four, uh, four bins, which I can barely read. Modality, specific sensory motor emotion systems, temporal parietal convergence zones, semantics, memory, uh, and memory, and uh, goal-directed activation selection of semantic information. So these are all aspects of semantics that he uh, breaks into sort of four different clusters. And if you look through this map or, or drawing, it looks like maybe there's maybe 10 semantic areas in this map, which is fine, but we should be able to do better than this. this is, these are very coarse uh, descriptions of the distribution of semantic information across the brain. So we did a, uh, an experiment um, that is a very different experiment from the normal way people do things. Normally, people, um, they simply have two conditions, uh, 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 say a word condition and a non-word condition, they subtract them. We had people listen to stories in the magnet. These are moth stories. These are very compelling sort of auto autobiographical narrative stories. People do nothing but lie in the magnet, listen to these stories. And now we model the data using a procedure that my lab has long used that actually grows out of system identification and engineering and our old neurophysiology work uh, called voxel-wise modeling. And this is a, just a forward encoding model framework. We take uh, the data, we have some stories, and we have some brain data. We hold the brain data aside for a moment. We take the stories and we extract features from the stories. For example, we might extract all the spectral features, all the phonemic features, all the syntactic features, and the semantic features. And so you can think of these different feature spaces as different hypotheses about what some part of the brain might represent. And now we take the brain data, and for each one of these features, simultaneously, we use ridge regression to uh, find a weight that optimally maps that feature onto the bold responses that we measure in the voxel. So the voxel is going to tell us what features it likes. And now, uh, since we have a lot of features here, we're going to overfit the heck out of this data really fast. So we have to be very careful about not overfitting. So we collect a second data set, which actually uses completely different stories. We take these new stories. We shove them through these feature spaces. We multiply them times the weights we calculated in the last stage. And now we look at the predictions of the bold responses relative to this new brain predictions in this cross-validated data set. And this allows us to, even though we're fitting five, 10,000 features, we don't have to worry about overfitting or type one error too much here. 
And uh, we're going to get something very important out of this. We're going to not only get statistical significance, we're going to get a prediction, and at, which gives us an effect size and uh, a prediction relative to the noise ceiling. Now, if we do this game with MRI, we've got a problem, which is MRI is not measuring neural activity. MRI is measuring bolt signal, the blood oxygen level dependent signal. And there's really no information in the bolt signal below about 0.3 hertz, three seconds. It's just gone because the blood system acts as a giant temporal low-pass filter on the data. So uh, if we look at the frequency distribution of in information content in uh, narrative speech, there's a lot of information about the vocal cords and glottal pulses and phonemes that is just going to be almost indistinguishable to us because all of this information occurs at a time scale that is uh, faster than our MRI measurement. This is the big problem with MRI is we're not measuring neurons, we're measuring blood flow. So we're going to be most sensitive to the information on the left of the line here, which is information about emotion, which is going to be really slow, semantics, or narrative. Uh, we might be able to pull out a little information about syntax and, and phonemes, but it, it won't be much because we're just not going to have the signal to noise to do that. Is this going to work? It's not doing anything. All right. Ah, yes it is. Okay, so uh, the brain is inconveniently folded up inside the skull. So we computationally extract the brain. We blow it up like a brain-shaped beach ball. We remove the giblets, because who cares about those? And then we flatten out the beach ball into like a pizza-shaped uh, pizza, well, a brain-shaped pizza, right? And the reason for doing that is now we can look at the distribution of the, uh, this functional selectivity across the entire brain simultaneously. Now this has a problem if you're used to looking at either folded brains or inflated brains, it's pretty hard to figure out how things relate to the flat map. But the nice thing is you can see everything simultaneously in the flat map. My computer is not behaving well today. All right. Uh, now, we fit a lot of models. These models are not independent. They are correlated with one another, right? The spectral information is correlated with phonemes. The phoneme information is correlated with syntax. The syntax information is correlated with semantics. So when we fit all these models simultaneously, some of the variance explained by each model is actually going to be covariant. So we uh, do a variance partitioning analysis, and that's what's shown here. Um, you can see we fit three models here, a spectral model, an articulatory model, which is essentially a phoneme model, and a semantic model. And, uh, these over here, although you can't see them, are the partials of the models. Uh, these flat maps show the prediction performance on a scale from 0 to 1. So these are the absolute cross-validated predictions in terms of correlation for each of these models. And what you can see is the spectral model fits pretty well in this area here, which turns out to be primary and uh, auditory cortex, um, A1 and A2. The articulatory model fits pretty well in primary auditory cortex, secondary auditory cortex, well, it fits not pretty well. It barely fits in primary auditory cortex, secondary auditory, a few other auditory cortex areas, a little bit up here in Broca's and, and a few other uh, places up near the superior temporal sulcus and uh, um, TPJ. And, but it's kind of a lousy model overall. Okay? But remember, the articulatory model should not be a good model because we're not collecting data at the time scale that is appropriate for the articulatory model. So the fact that our model does not fit well here doesn't mean you don't have a brain representation of articulatory data. It just means that that representation is invisible to us. The model that works really well, as you can see, is the semantic model. The semantic model fits uh, really well almost everywhere across the entire brain. So that's why the person who originally did this work, Alex Huth, decided to just focus on the semantic model. And this shows a blow up of the predictions of the semantic model. You can see it fits really well in the spirotemporal sulcus. It fits really well down here on the um, between the visual system and the auditory system. This is the temporal parietal junction. This is the precuneus and the retrosplenial cortex. And this is prefrontal cortex. You can see that the semantic model fits well almost everywhere except this location here. This is the motor and somatosensory strip where it fits very, very poorly, which is fine, right? That's, there's no motor task going on here. So let's just pay attention to that. <clears throat> and now we have a problem. OK, we have, say, seven subjects in this experiment. The semantic model has 985 semantic features. Don't worry about how we calculated them. It doesn't matter. They're features that, that reflect the meaning of the stories. Okay? And each subject has about 60,000 voxels. So each subject's data matrix is 985 by 60,000. We've got like seven or eight subjects. We have way too much data. What do we do with this data? 
Well, in, in science, when you have this problem, the first thing you do is dimensionality reduction, and the dumbest possible kind of dimensionality reduction you can do is principal components analysis. So when you take all of these different data matrices and you do principal components on them, you find out that it takes about 60 principal components to uh, represent about 95% of each individual subject's data. So that's how much data is actually in these matrices. There's not 985 features, there's 60 principal components. And that's due to the limitations of MRI. Now if you look at those 60 PCs across these individual subjects, you find out that all of the subjects share a low dimensional principal component space of four or five principal components that are also independent of the stimulus statistics. So these seem to be some common semantic representation across the subjects. And the other, say, 50 PCs in each subject reflect uh, stimulus statistics, noise, and individual differences. Right. So let's focus on that low dimensional principal component subspace. We can take all the individual matrices, we can concatenate them together, we can do PCA, and we can look at the first, say, three principal components. Let's just look at the first three to make our lives easy. Uh, now we have this principal component space, and this actually acts as essentially an intermediary between the feature space and the brain data. And we want to look at that uh, space. So we can take all of these 985 semantic uh, concepts, and we can project them into the first three PCs. Here's PC1 and 2, and here's PC2 and 3. And this doesn't show us anything about any specific point in the brain because we're aggregating over all the brain, right? We're projecting the features, which are the semantic features, into the low dimensional shared principal component space. And uh, to make a long story short, this end of this principal component space down here is uh, families and social relationships and nasty things that happen to families like murder and death and divorce. And this principal component, this end of the principal component up here is uh, descriptions of the material properties of objects and colors, like thicker, thin, green, and so on. This is the largest dimension of variance across the brain. If you wanted to create two stories you created that gave you as different brain activity as possible, one of the stories would be about uh, family murders, and the other story would be about sculpture. Those would give you completely different patterns of brain activity. But we don't really care about this because um, we care about the parcellation, not the whole brain semantic space. So um, what we can do is we can take these principal components, we can take each individual voxel, we can project into a principal component space, and we can color it according to its loading on principal component one, two, and three. And that's what's shown here. So um, this is again, left hemisphere, right hemisphere, visual systems in the middle, auditory cortex is here, prefrontal cortex is at the left and the right. This is the medial wall over here and here. Uh, and now the color of each individual voxel is uh, colored according to its loading in this principal component space. So voxels that have similar colors are voxels that represent similar semantic concepts. Voxels that have very different colors are voxels that represent very different semantic concepts. And uh, you can't see it up here because of the stupid experiment that I'm running while I'm giving this talk. But uh, red, red things are generally semantic concepts that are social concepts. And green things are semantic concepts that are, uh, bright green things are uh, material properties of objects. Uh, now, if you look at these maps, and if, this, if my laptop was behaving well and this slide looked good, you would see that these are very rich, rich, rich maps. There is a lot of interesting structure in these maps. Uh, the semantic uh, information seems to be highly represented through a huge swath of uh, extra strike cortex. This is the visual system back here. This is the higher order visual system. This is the sort of where the higher order visual system cuts off. It's back here. This is the precuneus and the retrosplenial cortex. This is the temporal parietal junction. The TPJ, so some of you may re recognize as uh, Rebecca Sachs's uh, theory of mind area. And if you look at what TPJ activates to in these autobiographical stories, it's a lot of social information about families and family relationships and social interactions. Uh, right above TPJ is a bunch of areas that seem to represent uh, physical structures of the world. Uh, there's a whole bunch of very rich structure on prefrontal cortex, including, including weird subdomains. If you could see this map, you would see that there's a, a pink domain followed by a green, followed by a pink, followed by a green, followed by a pink, followed by a green. You see those sort of punctate repeating structures all over prefrontal cortex in this subject. This is one subject, right? We're only doing this for one subject. We project the subject in the common space, but we're only looking at the data for one subject. The maps are complicated, and they're very rich. And semantic information, as uh, Jeff Binder and Hickok and Popel predicted, is pretty much everywhere. But it's not everywhere uniformly, right? Their semantic information is, is represented in very specific patterns, at least in this one subject. 
Now, um, there's really two things that you notice about these data. The first is any semantic concept is represented in multiple brain areas. And every, the second is that every brain area represents a constellation of related semantic concepts. So uh, to get a feeling for that, you can play with our online brain viewer that hopefully some of you have played with. Uh, if you go into the online brain viewer and you look and you click on a really dark green voxel, those turn out to be number related voxels. So this is a patch just above TPJ that contains a bunch of number related voxels. You can, well trust me, they're number related voxels. There's like 10 and 20 and, God, I can see that online, can I? Ha, huh, I can read it, you can't. There's uh, 8, 5, 16, 20, 2, 3, 4 on the bottom. And then there's some time, like month, week, and day. And on the top, which is uh, um, the top one here, which is uh, this. Uh, right. It's this one over here. Uh, it's similar. It's uh, stacked 20, 100, 10, twice, uh, 1,000 times, nearly counted 30. Okay, and if you go down to this one, which is also a number-related patch, you get uh, packed six, five, uh, half, 40, 128 <coughs> quarter pounds, so on. So these are three patches. They all represent numbers, and they all represent stuff related to numbers. The qu um, we don't really know if those are this, doing exactly the same thing or they're doing different things. Any theory of the brain that you have should say that these are doing different things. But they look the same to us, and I would argue that that's a limitation of MRI, right? Uh, our MRI resolution and the resolution of this experiment is finite, so what we end up doing is finding a bunch of repeated domains. If I had clicked on this uh, red patch here, and this red patch here, and this red patch here, they would all look to be similarly tuned. All the things with similar colors are similarly tuned, but they're probably representing different aspects of the world, we just don't know exactly how. Uh, there's an online brain viewer, but I understand that a bunch of people played with this already, so we'll skip that. So each semantic concept is represented at multiple locations, and each location represents multiple related semantic concepts. So now we would like to know, well, how do these maps vary across individuals? Because the data I showed you is just from one brain. So uh, here are five different brains. And even though uh, this projection compu projector computer interaction is bad, uh, you can see that they're similar-ish, right? Everybody has a big red patch. Uh, getting really bad, aren't you? A big red patch right here. There's a big red patch, there's a big red patch, big red patch, big red patch, big red patch, right? Everybody has this kind of greenish stripe, greenish stripe, greenish stripe, uh, greenish stripe, greenish stripe, greenish stripe, right? These maps are similar-ish, but they're all different. So how do we deal with this? Well, traditionally, this is a hard problem. Usually what we do is we just uh, morph all the brains into some average brain, which is called an MNI coordinate space, and we, um, and we just operate in that space. But the problem with averaging brains together is all the detailed information about the brains is lost. So we don't really want to do that. There's a more complicated thing you can do, which is the David Van Essen thing, uh, which is essentially what FreeSurfer does, um, which is you take the individual brains, you extract the gray matter from the brain, you throw away the white matter, now you take the gray matter and you inflate it and you map it onto a sphere, and now you take the spheres you get for different brains and you rotate them uh, until they align optimally, and you just operate in that space. There's another thing you can do, which is the Haxby Group's thing, which is to do functional alignment and ignore the anatomy, uh, which is a perfectly good thing to do in some sense. Functional alignment would be good for us because I've basically been ignoring anatomy, right? And um, this functional alignment is going to be some variant of or version of canonical correlation analysis. And it works, uh, but I'm not going to talk about that today. We have another paper on that coming out. Uh, instead, for this data, we decided to try something new. And the reason we tried something new is because I don't like any of these averaging methods. If you have 20 subjects, and you average all the brains together, and then you operate on that sort of average brain space or on the average data itself, you're basically saying that the distribution of data across the subjects doesn't matter. That the only thing that matters is the central uh, tendency, right? But the problem is um, these methods of aggregating data across brains are, uh, except functional alignment, which I haven't really thought of in this context, these anatomical methods of aligning brains are not uh, closed form solutions. So I can take brain A and I can try to align it with brain B by aligning the anatomical landmarks. But that will only work for the large cell cyan gyri. The small cell cyan gyri that vary hugely across brains, I have no idea how those different brains are supposed to be aligned anatomically. So whenever I align brains and I don't know what the right way to align is or to average or to morph, uh, 
uh, I'm going to lose information because I'm going to be doing smoothing and I'm going to be doing suboptimal smoothing, and that's always losing information. So we wanted to come up with a method that allowed us to aggregate data across brains, but which never required us to morph brains into a common brain space, and which preserved all of the distributional data across brains. And um, that took about five years and a lot, a lot of dead ends. And as a consequence, for years and years, all the papers out of my published, we, uh, all the papers out of my lab, we never averaged across brains. Instead, we would just uh, show all the individual brains, because then that, that precluded us from having to build an average model or an aggregate model. But we have to aggregate at some point. That's what everybody wants, and that's what science wants. So eventually, Alex, uh, my graduate student Alex Huth, realized that, there, that we were thinking about this wrong. We were thinking about this problem of aggregating information across brains in the normal frequentist discriminative model framework that we all think about, which is, well, I've got a bunch of individual units, I average them together, I take the central tendency, and my goal is to make the best central tendency I can make. And Alex realized that was completely wrong. The way we should be thinking about this is as a generative model. I don't actually want to operate on the data itself at all. I'm not trying to build a model of the average data point. What I want to do is I want to build a generative model that models the probability distribution, the sort of God distribution of brains that splits out individual brains as samples from the bowels of the probability distribution. And if I have that probability distribution, then I can retain all of the data from all of the individual brains because they are all points from this underlying probability distribution. And so Alex started working on this generative modeling framework, which I know Jeremy Mannix, Jeremy here? Uh, ah. And so um, the people at uh, Princeton, Jeremy and his old advisor, uh, came up with a similar kind of idea around the same time and did this with, I think, resting state. You did it with covariance data, right? Didn't you? Something like that? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is just a, it's a, there are multiple people, you know, every idea in science has multiple fathers and mothers. So um, this is uh, not, we're not the only ones that did this, but this is just what we did. So um, essentially, this is a ball and spring model. Uh, you assume that the brain is kind of like a pizza, and the functional areas of pepperonis tiling the pizza. And the problem is, you don't know how many pepperonis there are and where they are. So you have to essentially find the result of that. So um, what you can do is you assume that every brain has the, exactly the same number of pepperonis, but the only thing that matters is the shape and size of the pepperonis varies across brains. Then you can replace each functional area by a little ball, and you connect, can connect the uh, areas by springs, and now this is a physical ball and spring system that you can optimize across all of the brains. So what you want to find is a collection of balls and springs that uh, optimally predicts the functional data for every one of the subjects in your data set. And so this uh, model is going to um, share across subjects the ideal spring lengths, the spring constants, which is their springiness, and the functional means, meaning the functional assignment of each area. But unique to each subject is going to be the exact location and the exact uh, functional values on cortex for that individual subject. And um, this is a, a non-convex optimization problem. So I think our first time we ran this uh, took three months to run on a computer cluster. And I have a really large computer cluster. Uh, but now it's down to three days. And uh, our collaborators at Intel are trying to make it faster. So I'm hoping that it will be fast enough for people to actually use at some point soon. Um, this, uh, there's something I'm missing about this. Ah. OK, so this model makes a very strong assumption, right? It assumes that each one of these pepperonis has constant functional assignment. That if I find area x, every voxel in area x does exactly the same thing. And intuitively, you should, your first thought should be, That's, that cannot possibly be true, right? Even in v1, the voxels don't all do the same thing. There's a retinotopic map, so there's a gradient across v1, right? So all of these functional areas should be gradients, not they shouldn't be flat. OK, fine. You can include that in the pragmatic model if you want. It just makes it a giant pain in the rear end. So you may not want to do that as a first cut. Um, maybe you want to include covariance data in the pragmatic model. Well, sure, that, that can go in the model. Maybe you want to include diffusion imaging data. You can include that in the model. This pragmatic model, this generative modeling framework, can be enlarged to encompass a variety of different kinds of modes of data that you can collect. So I'm going to show you a parcellation here based on this model which is an oversimplified model, you shouldn't assume that it's the correct parcellation. It's just today's parcellation. Okay? So when you fit this model, you do it for, um, say you have seven subjects. You'll take subject one out, and you'll set them aside. And you'll fit the pragmatic model to the other six subjects. Okay? Now, the pragmatic model tells you about the probabilistic relationship between a few anatomical landmarks and 
all of the functional data that you expect to get in the language experiment. They're not really anatomical landmarks, they're functional landmarks, but they're acquired in a different data set, so we're not overfitting. So essentially what that's gonna do is it's going to tell me for any uh, brain that has a few anatomical landmarks, uh, what the probability distribution is of functional areas across that brain. So now I can take my subject one, which has some functional data, I can give it only the anatomy, none of the functional data, and it returns a map of where it thinks the brain, functional brain areas are. I can then compare the pragmatic map to the actual map that I obtained in my actual experiment, and I can calculate likelihood ratios across the entire brain. And red here means areas where there's a very high likelihood that that functional assignment that you actually observed uh, is consistent with the pragmatic map. Blue is locations where the, functional the function of the uh, brain that we observed in the experiment is not consistent with the pragmatic map. And white is I don't care. White is all the brain areas where the semantic model doesn't fit all that well. And if you notice, these likelihood maps, uh, double-visioned as they are, I'm very, I apologize, are mostly red. There's only a few little blue spots like this one here. And these tend to be almost always individual tiny functional areas that are shifted in one subject relative to where you expected them to be in the subjects, the whole from the probability distribution. So there are individual differences. In general, this pragmatic map works really well. And you can now take a new subject with no functional data whatsoever, give the anatomy to uh, the pragmatic algorithm, and it will return functional predictions of functional maps that are better than any other method that we know of, uh, especially better than the relevant competition, which is the MNI coordinate system. So this is a pragmatic uh, parcellation you get. Oh, God, this is so annoying. Uh, uh, from, this is uh, essentially the canonical map projected on the brain of one subject. Uh, now, there's a hyperparameter in pragmatic, which is how many pepperonis do you want? How many brain areas do you want? You don't know that a priori. There could be one brain area. There could be 500 brain areas. So you, that's a hyperparameter. You have to row across different fits of the pragmatic algorithm. And you can calculate the performance across different uh, numbers of brain areas. And you can see that this thing tends to flatten out at about 128 brain areas. Or in this case, there's 192 in the left and 128 in the right. But the number of areas you choose for this parcellation is in some sense kind of arbitrary. Um, so this shows the parcellation, one particular parcellation, for uh, the left and right hemisphere. Uh, and you can see that areas, if we take this area, which is the temporal parietal junction, uh, if you ran a temporal parietal junction localizer, theory of mind localizer, it would encompass this entire area here. And you can see the pragmatic says this is actually one, two, three, four, five areas that contain semantic information, and then a few areas that aren't semantic but would, might be picked up in the localizer. Uh, in fact, all of the localizers um, end up rec recovering sort of uh, um, subsets of the pragmatic areas. So this is a really large number of areas we're able to pull out of these data um, only from functional assignments and the underlying anatomy, but the underlying anatomy in this case is just the surface map of the, the shape of the brain. It has no actual uh, connectivity information in it. Now, uh, if you actually care about what the brain does, which some of us do, you can zoom in to a little area, like this is the temporal parietal junction, and you can actually try to figure out, okay, this is, L this is area LPC7, one of hundreds of areas that we pull out uh, in this uh, model. What is LPC7 tuned for? Well, now you have to go in and interrogate your voxel-wise model and try to find out what concepts LPC7 responds to. As you can see, this is LPC7, and it responds a lot to social concepts, a little bit to emotional concepts, uh, and it seems to be suppressed to tactile concepts, for example. So you can play that game if you care about functional assignments, uh, but for 200 areas, of course, that's gonna be very slow and we will be here all night, so let's ignore that. Now, another question you have, you might have is, okay, so you have this essentially parcellation of the brain that you got from functional data. How does that parcel parcellation of the brain relate to anatomical data? So now we have to find some anatomical data from humans. Well, what's the latest and greatest paper? It's the Glaser and Van Essen paper uh, that I talked about at the beginning of this talk um, that pulled out uh, about, I can't remember the exact number, somewhere between 100 and 200 anatomically defined areas. There was some task information used for this as well, but the task data was a very small proportion of the areas. And those, uh, their areas are shown in these hard outlines here, in these black lines. And um, the functional data is shown here in uh, the colored lines. This is the true functional data. 
And the pragmatic atlas is shown here uh, in this horrible double vision thing on the right. And now, now your problem, now the question is, are these consistent or are they not? And if you squint, who the hell knows? Who knows if these are consistent? There's so many of these little areas that Glazer pulls out, I have no idea if they're consistent or not. We don't really know. But this is the direction we're trying to go. The question now is, they only have anatomical boundaries. We have functional assignments. We can assign boundaries to the functional assignments by, by introducing this pragmatic model, which, which sort of assumes that actually this underlying smooth map is, consists of flat tiles. So in some sense, the pragmatic map and, their, and the Glazer map should correspond. And right now, they don't. But I wouldn't say that they don't. We just don't know. So that's a work in progress. It's a really hard problem. OK, so the, the second uh, conclusion is the semantic maps are remarkably consistent across individuals, uh, but the relationship to anatomy is currently unclear. Okay. So now, finishing up, uh, you may recall that we did some vision experiments. Oh, yes. Uh huh. So uh, maybe I'm missing some of the explanation. So if I look at both those, both, both those maps, the color patterns look like highly similar. So what am I missing? Oh, the color is all from our data. But that's all your data. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, remember, the color, the color on the left is the functional data. Right. The color on the right is the pragmatic assignments of functional areas to the functional data. The lines, these black lines, are the Glazer anatomical boundaries from the Human Connectome Project imported into PyCortex and projected on the same maps. So ideally, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're a you know, if, I, if David Van Essen ever heard me say that anatomy and function were not related to each other, I would be blackballed from science. So I have to say, I'm contractually required to say two things. A, anatomy and function are intimately related, and B, you should always show everything on flat maps. Those are the two Van Essen rules of life, okay? So, um, so that's what I'm doing here, all right? So we're trying to determine, we already, we already established flat maps are awesome. Now we're trying to determine if, uh, if there's a, a relationship between these anatomical boundaries and these functional boundaries. And you can see it's pretty clear on the left because we don't have this double vision problem over here. You can see that this, this boundary looks pretty good, right? There's pink stuff here. There's orange stuff here. This boundary looks pretty good. There's a division between this blue thing and this purple thing, right? And these red things are falling along the boundaries. But there's other places like TPJ where these anatomical boundaries don't follow this color, these color gradients at all. Right? They're completely unrelated. And you see that same kind of problem over here in the pragmatic map. It's just that because pragmatic is thresholding this in a, in a weird statistical way, it's thresholding this continuous map, the problem of phase offsets becomes even more pronounced. So there's some locations like here and here where it looks like there's a good correspondence between the functional maps and the glazer and atomical maps. And there's some places like TPJ and up here in our prefrontal cortex <coughs> where it's a horror show and there's like no relationship at all between our maps and the glazer maps. And again, I think that's because everybody's data sucks. Everybody's data sucks in different ways, but it, it all sucks. And so um, there's going to be, you know, it's going to take a long time. The data's going to have to be a lot better before we uh, can solve this problem. All right. So, uh, so I mentioned earlier we did a vision experiment. You can check it out, 2012. Uh, in this experiment, we showed people movies. And then we labeled all the objects and actions in the movies. And then we created semantic maps for objects and actions. It was about a 2,000 dimensional semantic maps. And what we found is that uh, semantic representation for uh, data in movies, information in movies, tiled all of uh, sort of extra striped cortex uh, beyond the retinotopic areas, which is what you'd expect based on uh, the fact that there's a bunch of functionally defined uh, areas in that part of the brain. But you can now take the uh, language semantic maps and the vision semantic maps and concatenate them together and look at that semantic space and try to determine if there's a common semantic space for the meaning of objects in movies and for the meaning of uh, concepts in stories. For example, if you see a face, do you, is the face-related activity related to at all um, the brain activity that is elicited when I tell you about a face? And it turns out, although you cannot see it here, that there is a relationship right along the margin of visual cortex. So this is the retinotopic areas here. Uh, between the retinotopic areas and things like FFA and PPA in these um, semantically selective areas, there's this region of icky cortex, 
that contains these higher order areas that don't have very good functional assignment, uh, yet they're clearly visual. So let's ignore those. And then we can go to these functional areas, which are nice, that everybody wants to work on, like uh, FFA and PPA and things like that. And if you look at the margin beyond FFA and PPA, um, it turns out that the semantically selective cortex, the, the cortex beyond just anterior to these functionally defined areas, uh, the semantic selectivity of that patch of cortex for semantic concepts and stories matches the semantic selectivity for the visually semantic cortex to the same concepts in movies. So for example, FFA is a fusiform face area, it contains a lot of voxels selected for faces, and if you look immediately anterior to FFA and the part of cortex that responds to stories but doesn't respond to movies, those voxels also tend to be responsive to faces and things related to faces. And that seems to be a general pattern across all of this patch of cortex. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, that's a work in progress. Another thing that we've looked at is the relationship between reading and listening. Um, so to do this, we took all of the stories. They were spoken stories. So we transcribed all the stories, and we presented the words in the stories um, using a rapid serial visual presentation paradigm, where the timing of the words in the stories was exactly the same as the timing that people had listened to the stories. And so now they fixate on a spot, and they see the words in the stories appearing on the screen. And now we can build a semantic model for the stories, and we can build a semantic model for the reading. For, so we can build a semantic model of listening, and we can build a semantic model for reading. And we can look to see if the model predicts uh, cross predicts, if listening predicts reading, and reading predicts listening. And uh, you can see this is reading predicting reading, that the correlations there, the predictions are good. Listening predicting li listening, the predictions are good. And if you look over here in the part of the screen that seems to be having some sort of diplopia, um, you can see that the maps for reading predicting listening and listening predicting reading are actually almost as good. In fact, you can predict the listening semantics uh, from reading just as well as you can predict the listening semantics from listening. So these semantic representations for the meaning of the information stories seem to be amodal. They don't seem to depend on whether you read the story or listened to the story. And that's also true for the semantic maps. This is the semantic map you get from listening. This is the semantic map you get from reading. Again, each point on this map, the color of the voxels indicates the semantic selectivity. And if you look at these two maps, they're almost indistinguishable, right? You would not know if this was listening and this is reading, or this was just session one and this was just session two from the same subject. So reading and listening seem to produce exactly the same semantic maps, which is, in some sense, kind of boring, but in other sense, kind of cool, right? It's nice to know that when you listen to a story, you read it, you're basically getting, building the same representation of the world. So there appears to be a systematic relationship between semantic maps for language and vision, and these maps appear to be stable regardless of the modality. Uh, now, because we're almost over time, I'm just going to mention this really quickly because we don't actually uh, have data on this yet. Um, the last question I, wanna, I, I want to uh, address is, are these maps going to change with attention? And the reason I want to mention this briefly, even though we don't have data on this from language, is that I think it's one of the most important outcomes of this line of research that uh, everybody ignores. Um, so everybody in neuroscience, Cognitive neuroscience, neurophysiology, we all assume kind of a baseline model of labeled lines. Neurons are like labeled lines. Neuron 42 fires, it tells me there's a vertical line. And it doesn't matter when neuron 42 fires, it always is telling me there's a vertical line. Our whole conception of how the brain is organized is based on this kind of implicit assumption that every neuron is like a labeled line, and therefore the output of every neuron always means the same thing, and therefore anybody downstream that's reading the code from that neuron can always assume the same thing about that code. The problem is the data, the neurophysiology data, don't actually agree with that. If you uh, go into prefrontal cortex, uh, this is a really nice paper from the Chafee Lab that just came out about a week ago, um, you find out that neurons in prefrontal cortex are hugely <coughs> task dependent. That what a neuron in prefrontal cortex tells you about the world depends on the task the animal is performing. Now this came out a week ago from Matt, Earl Miller had shown the same result 20 years ago. Most prefrontal neurons, the vast majority of prefrontal neurons are task dependent. This is not just true for prefrontal cortex. If you go back into area V4, if you have an animal doing a spatial attention task, the tuning curve will remain pretty constant under different spatial attention conditions. It'll just be that the gain or the baseline changes. But if you have the animal do an object attention task, a feature-based attention task, the tuning curves of the neurons change, 
and they change by about the same magnitude as the baseline and gain changes you see with spatial attention. So even back in V4, we're seeing that neurons are changing their tuning. So uh, this is the way we've always thought about this problem. Imagine that my neurons or my voxels are a bunch of basis functions that tile some space. And now I tell you, just attend to this location of space. Well, what happens is the system as a whole tries to implement a matched filter, meaning it tries to reallocate its resources so that all the basis functions shift down and they represent the part of the space that's relevant really, really well. But since you have fixed hardware, they have to do that at the cost of representing the parts that, aren't, that don't matter. And then when you attend somewhere else, the voxels or neurons shift up and they represent that part of the space. You can also think of this as a stretching of the space. So you have some baseline semantic space in this example, and then you stretch and warp this uh, space depending on attention. That's sort of a, a match filter kind of hypothesis. It says, that, it says that every voxel is trying to be as involved in the task as it can. And uh, its task dependency is probably going to, its, its ability to be involved in a task is going to depend on where in the brain it's measured. And to make a very long story short, because I'm out of time, I'm just going to point out that if you put people in a movie task where they're asked in condition A, search for vehicles, and in condition B, search for people, the semantic maps you get in those two conditions are completely different. And the amount by which they're different uh, depends on how far the voxel is from the visual system. So voxels in the primary visual system don't really change their tuning much at all based on whether you're looking for people or vehicles. But if you look in prefrontal cortex, the voxels up there completely change their tuning depending on if you're looking for people or vehicles. And um, this is true for, this is gonna be true, if you think about it, for any network where you have an input layer that where the gain of the filters can be altered. And across successive layers of processing, you pool information. If you have a system like that, changing the gain of units down here at the bottom level will always change the tuning up here at the top level. And that's exactly what we see here in prefrontal cortex. So that suggests that the tuning of all of these voxels that we're seeing in the front of the brain, and if you notice on those semantic maps for language, there were a lot of voxels in the front of the brain that were representing information about the meaning of the stories. The tuning of those voxels is going to depend on what you are doing with the stories, which makes the problem of uh, understanding the brain a lot more complicated and difficult. So uh, this is my, basically my last slide. There's a few remaining issues that we haven't dealt with yet. Um, is each concept multiply represented or is each representation unique? We don't really know that yet because we don't have enough resolution. Does each location really represent multiple concepts or are local maps more detailed and specific? In other words, do we have columnar organization below the level of this coarse pragmatic parcellation? And the answer is, of course we do. You know there's columns in there. They probably represent more information. But we can't look at that with current MRI. We won't be able to look at that till the next generation of MRI, which will be in about five years, and we'll get down to about uh, 500 microns resolution. When we can do that. We can look at individual cortical columns. Uh, are our representations semantically constant? Or are they described as gradients? They're certainly described as gradients. We just don't have pragmatic you know, form that it models gradients yet. But we, we know we can do that. We just haven't put in the effort. Are these functional areas organized into functional networks? Well, almost certainly, right? If I have a semantic, if I have a semantically selective area that represents social concepts, it's unlikely to have its dominant projection to a different semantically selective area that represents, say, the structure of objects, right? We assume that these things are organized into networks. We just don't really have very good data for looking at that yet. And uh, your first thought might be that you could look at that with uh, functional connectivity, which is actually just covariances between voxels. But there are technical reasons why that's a problem, which I can rant about for eight hours if you give me the chance. Uh, do these representations change during language production? Aha, language production. Everything I told you about was comprehension. And I told you at the very beginning of this language part of this talk that language production systems are almost independent from language comprehension systems. And if you think about it, what your brain has to do when you're producing language is very different from when you're listening to language. When you're listening to me speak, the exact phrasing that I use, who really cares? You're just trying to get the gist, right? The specific words don't really matter. But when you're producing language, the specific order of the words matters a lot because it influences how clear you are. So there's a very different weight on syntax versus semantics in production versus comprehension. And you can imagine that the whole brain might reorganize under those two uh, cases. So we're doing a bunch of language production experiments right now, and I hope you will able to tell you the result of that uh, next spring. I already know the result of this, but I'm not allowed to tell you yet. But it's really cool. All right. How do these results relate to psychological theories of conceptual knowledge, which are like embodied con 
uh, cognition, right? Usually, if I give this talk about conceptual knowledge and semantics, a psychologist in the audience who's been thinking about this for 30 years always asks about a theory. Well, wait, you've you showed me a map. That, who cares about a map? That's an implementation detail. I want to know about what, how do you get you know, semantic information? Is embodied cognition really a legitimate theory? And my answer to that is, I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. I have an MRI machine. The MRI machine makes maps. That's all it does, okay? So I use my MRI machine, and I made a really stinking good map. Now, you, if you're a psychologist, have a separate question, which is, I don't care about this implementation. I learned about computation. What, at a system level, is the system doing with the information in this map? I have no clue, and not only do I not have a clue, I don't even know how you answer that problem. I think the biggest unsolved problem that we have in cognitive neuroscience is linking the conceptual computational map, uh, models that we have in psychology from behavior and the actual data we have in with MRI, which has nothing to do with behavior directly. And that involves a lot of assumptions that, you, that, that if you want to really do that well, those assumptions are going have to have to be stated explicitly. You're going to have to do the whole modeling framework to evaluate them and to look at predictions and see how well those uh, models do. And nobody's doing that right now. Nobody even knows how to do that. Really, nobody in the entire field has any idea of how you approach this problem. But it is the most important problem. So I just want to advocate voxelwise modeling. You can do this voxelwise modeling with anything. So this is a voxelwise modeling experiment with decision tasks, narrative stories, and short films. You can see it works for anything. And the last thing I will do, the last contribution I will give you that's actually useful for you is I will tell you about CaseForge. I don't know if this movie is going to play. Uh, but CaseForge is a startup done by one of my um, postdocs, James Gao, and it's a way to solve the worst problem in MRI, which is motion. Everybody knows motion MRI is bad. Um, functional connectivity data are hugely dominated by motion. It's an artifact that you can't get rid of correlation data, and it's, everybody knows it's a problem. Everybody tries to pretend it's not a problem. Um, there's another problem. You end up with these big experiments where you have multi-session experiments, which is every time you put somebody in the magnet, their head ends up in a different place in the coil. And that means that the hot spots and the cold spots in the head end up in different places in the head. And that means you can't aggregate the data across sessions because you have different signal to noise characteristics for every voxel. So what you need to solve these problems is a method of putting people in the magnet where they do not move their head and where their head ends up in exactly the isocenter of the magnet every single damn time. So the way we do that is we have a laser scanner. We have somebody wear a little, uh, a little um, bathing cap. We take this laser scanner, and the laser scanner makes a three-dimensional model of the skull. We previously took our nice 32-channel Siemens coils, and we did a laser scan of that. So now we have a laser scan of our Siemens coil. We have a laser scan of your head. Now we can, with it, by using a CAD CAM program, we can calculate the empty space between your head and the coil. And we can send that empty space to a computerized milling machine that makes this, which is a foam head case that perfectly fits around your head and perfectly fits inside the coil. And now you cannot move because every single place in the space that you could move to is occupied by something else, which is foam. <laughs> this thing, you might think, that oh, this seems horrible. Actually, this is more comfortable than being shoved into the MRI coil and then getting padded with pads. And it's perfectly consistent across sessions. So you can now sit in the in the, in the head coil for longer. You can go in for multiple sessions and be sure that you're always getting the same signal to noise. This thing removes motion so well that the main motion artifact you get is due to what I call the lollipop effect, which is your brain's kind of like a lollipop. It's the, like the sucker end of the lollipop on a stick. And the stick is your spinal cord. So we can make sure the lollipop is in the same place in the helmet. But unfortunately, the lollipop's hooked to a stick. And when you move your butt, that actually moves your spinal cord, and it moves the base of your brain inside your skull, even though your skull is in exactly the same place. So, we can, so if you want to get rid of the butt movement influence, you can. But you need a separate second device. We call, this, we call this the brain burrito. The second device you need is called a body taco. Kind of folds you up. But you can do it. So, so we're going to be making these things. We'll send, you, uh, we'll send you a laser scan. This is a shameless plug for an actual company, because my postdoc's starting a company. He'll send you a laser scanner. You can laser scan your subjects. The laser scan automatically gets sent back to our servers. The, the device gets milled and it gets sent to you, uh, depending on how much money you want to pay, by whatever, how fa however fast you want it. Right? And so um, these are really cool, and I suggest you use them. Anyway, that's it. Thanks very much for your time, and I know I went over. It.
And I do apologize for the really lousy slides. They are not the fault of the AV people at Dartmouth. They are the fault of Linux. Don't blame them. <laughs> so we have time for just a couple questions, and then there's a reception outside, uh, so you can ask Jack more questions at the reception. Yes. Uh, uh, about individual differences. Um, so. Uh, yes. So, um, so I wonder. It's it's hard to think. So. so um, what what about like for example colorblind people right so so the, the conceptual representation will be very different so in, in your data do you have colorblind people for example or? okay so uh, so my so I'm yeah I'm a monkey neurophysiologist right and so in the monkey world you need two monkeys you really only need one monkey but you're always worried that that one was cheating so you get two okay right. and after that nobody ever collects more than two monkeys because that would just be insane right it's bad enough for using two monkeys. So my philosophy is the same about MRI. Uh, I, always, I made this joke at lunch. My, my, I always say, for, if you do your MRI experiment right, you should only need one subject. Unless it's an individual differences study, in which case you need two subjects. Right? So we generally try to collect as few subjects as possible, and we collect a lot of data from those subjects. Instead of, you know, you can imagine doing the, flipping the matrix the other way and collecting a little data from a lot of subjects. We collect a lot of data from a few subjects. Uh, so we don't really have any way to look at individual differences because the biggest experiment I've ever done was like 12 subjects. So I'm trying to convince the government to give me enough money to collect data from 50 hours of MRI from 50 subjects. So um, that should be enough data to really look at individual differences. But the, that MRI is very, very expensive and um, no one in the government has decided that that's worth doing it yet. So. But we're, but we're working on that. So I can't really tell you anything about individual differences. Yes. Um, oh, sorry, there was a question over here. Yeah. Oh, oh, well, the, the microphone's over there, so go ahead. Okay, <laughs> there's two microphones, but um, I don't know if I need it. Um, so kind of two questions. One is about the, th there's comments um, you made about theory and connecting theory to maps. Yeah. Um, so in, in one way, we're, you know, you, you've uncovered kind of a candidate theory I suppose, right? Is it kind of a discovery process where you've got these PCs, right? Right. So that that could be a kind of theory of the organization, semantic organization of the brain, right? So so if, if we're going to identify what those PCs are, so then the, the second part of the question is related to identifying those PCs, um, and so I, it's a, a question um, which maybe I didn't understand how you related. So first, if I understood, you did PCs within each individual subject, mm -hmm. PCA, mm -hmm. and then you got something like fifty or a hundred yeah. or something per subject, and then you ended up with just four. Ah, okay, so uh, we'll answer both those questions. The, the, the first is how do the maps, can, can, you, can you take the maps as a theory of the brain? And you know, I, being a physiologist, I'm perfectly comfortable doing that because that's what all physiologists do all the time. Right? I've got a bunch of neurons, I make a theory. And that's not a problem. But um, usually people who are theoretically motivated they, you know, they have a theory that they're interested in, they, and they want to test that theory, and they want to see how good it is, and, and that's where, um, if, you're, if you're trying to test a theory by collecting MRI data, you, you know, there's a, there's a big, there's a bunch of assumptions you have to make, and every MRI experiment that is testing a theory involves a bunch of assumptions. Unfortunately, usually those assumptions are unstated, and a lot of times those assumptions are wrong. For example, linearity is a very common assumption that studies make, uh, and this system is clearly not linear in any, it's a nonlinear dynamical system. It's not linear by definition. Um, so, but I don't. But I don't think going from the maps up is actually any better than going from the computational down. I think both communities have problems. It's really hard to think of a behavioral theory and then try to determine how that behavior is implemented in the brain. And it's really hard to see a bunch of brain data and try to determine how that's influencing behavior. I think those are just really unsolved, really hard problems. And I don't have any magic for that, other than trying to beat it to death with a huge amount of data. As far as the principal components goes, uh, it's pretty simple. Each subject has a 50-dimensional space. So these are vector spaces, because they're, they're orthonormal vectors, because they're principal components, right? So now this person has this vector space, and this person has this vector space, so I can look to see how closely they're aligned. And uh, if the vectors are almost identical between subjects, I can say, well, those are the, the same components. And if they're very different from uh, cross-subjects, I can say they're different components. 
And then I can also compare those principal codes to the stimulus PCs. Uh, and so the, in the experiments we do, usually almost any one of these big data experiments, we end up with something on the order of 50 to 100 PCs that are, don't seem to be noise. And that's a limitation of MRI. Right? MRI is just only going to give you 100 PCs. That's just the best you're going to do. Then um, we can look at the PCs that are common, which are the PCs that are aligned. And that usually ends up being, say, 4 to 5. But I think that's also a limitation of MRI. I actually think people have more, uh, much larger than four-dimensional common semantic space. But I just think we can't see it because of noise. But, so I, I, I think there's a, a, well, there's a potential solution to that in terms of the, PC, the PCA that you do, right? You could do a, a group PCA to begin with, right? Um, like, yeah. like status type of um, th uh, three-way three PCA, right? So you find a common PCA solution that from the beginning. Well, and let's, let's because, this offline, this yes, is, okay. This conversation can get really arcane really quick. I think so. Yeah. I'm happy to talk to you about it. You had a question. Uh, yes. Uh, so there's the central dogma of neuroscience, I guess, which is that anatomy you know, determines or constrains function. Uh, and I see you poking at it to see if it'll budge. Um, all, all this work, has this made you kind of more of a, a believer in that? Or are, you fi are there fun little hints um, that undermine uh, the connection between function and anatomy? Ah. Fun so, so I actually, e even though I've published, you know, neurophysiology and MRI attention studies saying that attention changes tuning. I still think that you know, the anatomy function dogma is legitimate dogma. What, however, the function of a neuron or a voxel embedded in a deep network is uh, not, that, that is not fixed in the space in which we usually measure it. In other words, in the labeled line space, right? The, those, the function of those neurons and those voxels does not relate invariantly to the features that we're manipulating in our experiment. Presumably, those voxels or neurons are constant. They're labeled lines in some higher dimensional space. But we don't know what that higher dimensional space is. But the key, I think the key uh, concern is if you have a voxel or a neuron, it doesn't matter, right? For the purpose of the discussion, they're the same thing. Uh, I have some neuron in prefrontal cortex. And when I'm searching for a cat, it becomes a cat detector. Now I'm searching for a dog and it becomes a dog detector. That means that anybody that is reading the output of that neuron has to know what I am looking for. Otherwise, that neuron cannot possibly interpret the signal because the interpretation is all task dependent. So now we have a problem. We have huge swaths of the brain. The, the part of the brain that makes humans most different from macaques, which is prefrontal cortex, and almost every neuron in that big bowl of brain has a task dependent um, Response and therefore a decoder has to be has to include task information. We don't have any computational models that explain how that task information is represented, or how it gets percolated around, or how it's controlled. Is there one little man in the head or a little woman in the head that like knows about the task and that's broadcasting to everybody? Is it distributed information? Is it an emergent property? Nobody has a clue. And the reason nobody has a clue, well, there's two reasons. A, it's really really hard problem. Okay. B, nobody wants to think about it. Which is common for really hard problems, right? It's really, that's, that's too problem, that's too hard. I'm just going to pretend it's a labeled line and do my job and like ignore this, right? And, but I think that this is going to become increasingly important as we, you know, and, and the time you see this when you try to do a functional parcellation of prefrontal cortex, that's where this, this problem really, you know, hits you in the eye. You cannot avoid it. It's a really, it's a really hard problem. And it makes our, it makes our uh, mapping problem uh, worse. So if you, uh, sorry. One more thing. If you think about it, here's the dumbest model of the brain you could ever make. I have a bunch of voxels. I have a bunch of features in the world, okay? And I have a bunch of attention states. So I have a three-dimensional cube, and I just want to make a model of each of these entries in the cube. And once I fill out that cube, I have, I have a model of the brain. It's a lookup table. It's a stupid model of the brain, but it's a model, okay? Now, I can, the voxels I can measure all at once. That's not a problem. The features, I can put in movies or language and measure a lot of features really, really quickly. So those two axes, those two margins of this three-dimensional cube, I can measure quickly. But this attention axis, I can't measure it quickly because I have to tell you what task to do, and that's really slow. And if this third margin of the cube, if you can't marginalize over that, if you can't ignore it, that means that it just makes our problem of trying to understand the brain a million times worse because it means that you actually have to 
look at these various parts of the brain under different tasks, and that's the worst possible way to try to collect data. So it's, it's, a, it's a problem. So if, if you prefer to, like, I don't mind being depressed, I think I'm going to be dead and nothing I will do will matter anyway, it doesn't bother me, I've come to, I've come to a, a, a combination with that, realization. But if you uh, feel like you have to die believing that you actually were successful, don't think about attention. That would be my own <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if we were talking so long so to avoid my question, but um, <laughs> let's say we saw already many parcellations, and making parcellation is really easy. Pretty much many people did it, right? So what, besides naming I trust this guy, right? <laughs> How could we know that this parcellation is any good or representative or that's the one we should use ah. even to assign to a function or something like that, right? would say that's not just an argument about correlation. that's an argument about results. How do I know what results I should believe and what results I shouldn't believe? Well, for that we have stats. So far for any parcellation, didn't have any single number which would describe it even in comparison to any other parcellation, right? It's like, ah, it's like this that's one. That's not our fault, that's their fault. No. And I'll, yes, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. So I think of science, you know, science basically has three stages. I'm not a philosopher of science, so I can be sloppy here. You know, I measure something, right? I make an explanation of my measurements. Hopefully, an explanation whose dimensionality is lower than my measurements, otherwise I'm kind of cheating. And now, I take this explanation and I predict outside of set and see if it generalizes to new situations. And if my model's right, that will work. Okay? The criterion is prediction. And in our parcellation, we actually have predictions. Because in every experiment we do, we, cap we collect two data sets, a fit set and a test set. All of our modeling work is done in the fit set. On the same subject. On the same subject. So maybe it's blood flow, maybe it's blood vein structure. You don't know. You can predict across subjects too. So that's sure. what pragmatic does. So pragmatic is a, is a multi subject model that uh, essentially calculates the probabilit probabilistic relationships between, uh, I, I say anatomy, but really it's classic functional localizers and these complicated maps. And now I have a new subject and I give it just some small amount of seed data to sort out where in this probabilistic relationship it should be, and it gives me predictions of the maps. And, and then you use... To be actual observed data. And then you use accuracy, dice yeah. coefficient. So if yeah. you have 200 areas, do you have accuracy for that, or...? You have accuracy for each individual area. You, okay. have, you have both statistical significance, and effect size, and prediction accuracy. And prediction accuracy relative to the noise ceiling mm -hmm. for every voxel in every area. And one of my uh, many complaints about my field is um, most people don't ever report predictions. They don't ever report effect size. They don't ever report uh, any kind of noise ceiling. They just count, they just report statistics. Colored, pi uh, colored figures still cost money. Uh, well, you cannot, colored figures still cost lots of money, right? So you cannot do all of them. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, really this all has to be done in terms of prediction. That would be, that would be my argument. And um, the problem with the an anatomy data, well, I mean, you could, the problem in it with anatomy data is what are you going to predict? Right? And I, I, to be fair to the anatomists, um, they, they have done some of this. So uh, there's been some efforts in the diffusion imaging literature because they have a big problem of signal to noise and, uh, and, and, and poor data. Uh, there's been some efforts in the diffusion imaging data to both link the diffusion imaging parcellations to actual ground truth from brains they sliced up, which is actually better than we have for functional data, and to uh, sort of cross-predict. You know, I, I build a diffusion map, and then I look to see if it actually predicts some other data, like say, correlation data between two boxes. So there's been a lot of efforts to do that. We, again, this is a this Just is a thing. one more. Just one. Okay. No, 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 so we can stop. talk about this till tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, you are. <laughs> we can argue about this. You and I can argue until like next week. But almost anything, really. <laughs> That's why I like you. Yeah. <laughs> Do you? Oh, you didn't have a question. So we have a question. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much.